Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's museum crawl. My name is Elena Munoz, and I am one of the curatorial assistants at the Newark Museum of Art. I'm here with Nadia Rivera Fala, Associate Curator of Contemporary Art at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Nadia will be highlighting works currently on view as part of the Cleveland Museum of Arts exhibition, A Graphic Revolution, Prints and Drawings in Latin America. In 2015, Nadia was a Mellon Curatorial Fellow here at the Newark Museum of Art. She returned to the museum in 2017 as a research associate and was an instrumental part of the reinstallation of the Seeing America 20th and 21st Centuries galleries on our second floor, specifically with the Latin American Abstraction Gallery. Um, there will be a question and answer portion after the presentation. So if you're joining us on Zoom, we invite you to submit your questions via the Q&A feature. And if you are joining us on Facebook Live, feel free to submit any questions via the comments section. And now, without further ado, I'll pass it off to Nadia. Good afternoon and hi to everyone. And thank you for joining us. Um, I am so excited to be here with Elena. Um, yeah, I just wanna share a few works from a show that is currently up at the Cleveland Museum of Art uh, called A Graphic Revolution, Prints and Drawings in Latin America. And this show was organized by a wonderful colleague of mine, Brittany Salisbury at the Cleveland Museum of Art, and is a show that highlights artworks created in moments of intense social change and political upheaval in Latin America, across Latin America. And so because of COVID, the show opened in March initially, but will be up through November in Cleveland. And you can find it on the website. All of the works are on the website and hopefully the galleries will open sometime this summer. <laughs> And so I'll start with the first image. Perfect, thank you. And I'm showing you one image from the exhibition by an artist named Jose Guadalupe Posada made in 1900. And his imagery and others like it are precedents, uh, early precedents of graphic popular arts in Mexico prior to the Mexican, Mexican Revolution, which took place in, which started in 1920. And Posada and artists before him, whose identity, art, other artists whose identities we don't know, used imagery, this imagery of calaveras or skeletons towards political satire, which is what you see here. So in this newsprint and others like it, the skeleton serves as a caricature used to expose government's lies and corruption. Later, following the Mexican Revolution, when artists like Diego Rivera took up the ideology of producing large scale artworks for the masses, predominantly in the form of public murals commissioned by the government, they took some inspiration from Posada and his ability to chronicle the attitudes and events of the, area, of the era to a really large and um, largely illiterate Mexican public. So in addition to muralists, Posada and his ability to convey narrative and political messages through these almost like didactic prints was also hugely influential for the inception of the People's Graphic Word Workshop or El Taller de Grafica Popular, which started in Mexico in the 1930s. And it was a print shop and artist collective that advanced revolutionary causes and operated for years and years um, until recently, in fact, I think about 2010. And so this is one of the earliest works in the show and really amazing that it's in the CMA's collection because it's such, he's, Posada was just such an influential kind of um, foundational artist for this history that the exhibition is telling. So moving on to another um, artist in the exhibition, I'm showing a self portrait by the artist Rufino Tamayo from 1927. And Tamayo was not as much a part of the muralist movement, although he did a couple of murals um, in public spaces, but he mostly made drawings and paintings on a smaller scale. And he was what the, mural, the muralists like Diego Rivera, Siqueiros Orozco might have negatively referred to as an easel painter since he did a smaller practice, but his imagery holds critical insight into a changing Mexico at this time. And he was very strategic about the way that he presented himself. 
So in this self portrait, scholars often comment that Tamayo is highlighting his indigenous features and his Zapotec heritage at a time when Mexican national identity was shifting to centralize its rural working class agricultural poor. So a population that was largely indigenous in Mexico. Um, and in many ways, his art also exposed the contradictions of indigenism in Mexico. So namely, the idea that while indigenous residents images were appropriated and bolstered as these symbols of change and popular progress, this population remained entirely disenfranchised still. So in this image, Tamayo is taking control of his own indigenous likeness and it's a face that stares out, it's very striking. It stares out at the viewer confrontational and it's very a direct gaze. Um, so he's really kind of taking, care, taking control of his own imagery. Um, moving on to another great work in the show. Uh, this is an artist that also emphasized the indigenous population and his name is Carlos Merida. And Merida is originally from Guatemala, so a country with a large indigenous population. And he traveled throughout, Par throughout Paris in the 1920s and encountered artistic movements like Cubism, um, surrealism, these other artistic styles that were popular in Europe at the time, and eventually settled and made Mexico his adopted home. So, hers, so his work um, as a result is this fusion of sorts between ancient and modern styles and influences. And in this work, he depicts women, what you're looking at is um, a drawing of women washing laundry in a river among rocks. And we know that he was looking at ancient Mayan art. So these very static, isolated figures, a few of which are shown in profile are indicative of this uh, ancient Mayan modes of representing figures. Um, but at the same time, the way these figures are truncated and suspended in space in the picture plane uh, with these kind of glowing, these great glowing blue auras around them is also very surreal. And so the figure, the, the image, the imagery hovers between figuration and abstraction. And it's also interesting to note that the last two works I've shown, this one by Merida and the previous one by Tamayo, came into the CMA's collection from a Cleveland based collector whose name is Lucia McBride. And she was an adamant collector of Mexican art and pushed for exhibitions and acquisitions by Mexican artists um, during her lifetime, long before it was in vogue. And so she died in 1970. So these both came into the collection in 1957 and they remain some of um, these stellar works in the CMA's collection by Mexican artists. Um, so coming into the present, the last work that I'll share from this exhibition um, in, in order to highlight a contemporary artist is a work by Fidencio Fifield Perez, who was born in Oaxaca, Mexico, but is now based in the US. And this artist has spoken about the experience of his experience of crossing the border as a child into the US and struggles as an undocumented person um, and a recipient of the still now unfortunately threatened DACA program and how it's transformed his artwork and imagery and his desire to show the everyday life of migrants. And this image has a nice connection, I think, to the Merida that I showed in that there's two figures again, waiting in the water at the bottom of their legs truncated and they're isolated against this um, blank background. And the image, which is a lino cut is the medium harkens back, of course, to this deep tradition, print tradition in Mexico, but makes use of very contemporary imagery. And the title is Brothers Collecting Shells. But when I admit that when I first saw the image, um, I read it as a border crossing, uh, kind of coming to, through the Rio Grande, which is like a natural border um, that stands between the US and Mexico. And in fact, the artist first titled this work El Rio or the river before changing it to its current title. Um, so in either interpretation of the imagery, there's this wonderful connection or connotation of labor, of movement, of survival, all captured in this really kind of monument-like double portrait of these two figures. Um, so taken together, the Graphic Revolution exhibition shows the scope of Latin American works in the CMA's collection. I've chosen to just highlight Mexican artists from 1900 to the present, but there's a huge geographic diversity to the artists, artists from Brazil, Chile, Cuba, Argentina, as well as this historical breadth. Um, 
So I encourage you to check out cma.org and you can, if you go to exhibitions, you can see an entire checklist of the exhibition and see all of the wonderful works that my colleague Brittany Salisbury has um, curated into the show. Um, but Elena, I'd be interested to talk also about Newark's Latin American collection, much of which is a little bit different because it falls under the purview of the American collection. And there has been a push, and this was something that I was very honored to have participated in during my time at Newark, but to understand American in a hemispheric context rather than um, referring to it as exclusively the United States. So this is you know, something that I loved about the Newark Museum. So do you want, let's, let's look at a few works from um, the Newark's collection. Yeah, thank you, Nadia. Um, so as many of um, visitors, the visitors and members of the Newark Museum of Art um, probably know from its beginning, the museum has been interested in collecting and showing art from around the world. And the museum has actively collected and exhibited work from Africa, Asia, and to a lesser extent, Latin America. Um, in 1915, the museum added its first painting from a Latin American artist to its collection, a work from Uruguayan born painter Francis Luis Mora. Um, and the museum currently has works from Caribbean artists, Central American and South American artists, as well as from a number of US, US based Latinx artists. Um, and Nadia, as you said, the New York Museum of Art is also really adamant about the idea that Latin American art is, is American art and that American art doesn't just refer to works by artists within US borders. Um, so the first work that we are going to look at, um, I tried to choose works from artists across Latin America and across media and disciplines and works that I felt um, kind of highlighted this idea that Latin American art is American art. Um, so this first work is from Cuban born artist Ana Mendieta. Um, during the political turmoil of the 1960s in Cuba, uh, Mendieta was sent to the United States from, from Cuba under Operation Peter Pan. Um, so this forced her to leave her family and her homeland. Um, and in the 1970s, she began her Silhouetta series in which she recreated the form of her body using the earth as her material. So um, in this photo, we can see the absence of her physical body and um, the absence of the physical body in the final image um, implies or refers back to her childhood displacement. Um, the curved shapes of what is meant to be a female form um, recall primeval earth deities and the female forms made from earth refer to Santeria, which is an Afro-Cuban syncretic religion um, whose rituals can involve earth, fire, water. Um, and she would make the outline of the figures um, with gunpowder, um, which she would pour on the ground and then set on fire. Um, and this also relates to Santeria's use of fire to make mystic drawings. Um, so there's a lot of Afro-Cuban and Santeria influence in her work, but this piece was created in the state of Iowa. So, um, so here there's this idea of a literal transnational body. Um, I think this work in particular speaks well to the idea that, that Latin American art is American art, that this was created by this Latin American woman um, in the state of Iowa, which is, is pretty, we, we definitely associate with as being kind of this all American place. Totally. And Mendieta is interesting because she, um, even though she was Cuban, she was Cuban American, but mm -hmm. spent some time in Oaxaca, Mexico, and went back and forth a few times and found the archaeological sites and the ancient Mayan culture there hugely influential. Um, and so there is also this integration of this pre-Columbian kind of indigenous um, formal language that is, right. you know, brought into works like this, like this sort of glyph-like outline of a figure. Um, so yeah, and ties it a little bit to the kind of the Merida and the other works that we were looking at before from the CMA's collection. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, next slide, please. 
So this next work is a sculpture by Edgar Negret, um, who is a Colombian artist known for his geometric sculptures and mechanical objects um, that have no specific purpose. Um, the, he would make these mechanical objects that weren't really meant to do anything. Um, and so this sculpture is, is pretty small. It's a small wall mounted work, only about two feet high. Um, and his works depict natural forms like the sun and flowers, but he subverts that by using industrial materials. Um, and Negret lived temporary, temporarily, excuse me, in New York City in the late 1940s, where he met US artist sculptor Louise Nevelson and hard edge painter Ellsworth Kelly. Um, and for anybody who might be familiar with Nevelson or Kelly's work, um, you may be able to see how they and Negret may have influenced each other or the exchange of ideas that may have happened during his time in New York. Um, so, <laughs> Right, yeah, and I was just going to say, like, in, in um, to elaborate a little bit on your great point about the uselessness of it, I always loved how this piece has these um, joint, these like studs in the corners as if, it's, yeah. as if that's doing anything or holding it together, um, but really gives it like this industrial feel. And uh, in Newark's galleries, once they're open again, this work is also around the corner from the like really iconic Stella Brooklyn Bridge. And so in thinking of like the, you know, you really get the sense of the, things he would have seen and been really struck by, like in New York, like these monumental industrial bridges. Um, and so how he adopts some of that um, industrial language into these, um, into these, these sculptures. Right, yeah, and I, I think, yeah, to your point, being able to kind of see that visual language or to kind of connect that thread to um, the Negret sculpture and the Stella piece is just, I think, really important for visitors um, to understand that there's not really this clear divide between Latin American art and American art. Yeah. Yeah. And even thinking of it through some of the works that we looked at previously, it all, it almost has kind of like a, a form, um, like a form, like an organic form, like it kind of looks like an animal on its side or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> like, or like a, uh, the first time I saw it, I thought it kind of looked like a, a pitcher pot. Um, okay. Pitcher pot plants that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, could, it could be many things. Okay. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so the final painting that I wanted to show and talk about is Formas Entrelazadas in Fondo Rojo, or Interlocking Shapes in Red Background. Um, it's one of the Newark Museum of Art's most recent Latin American acquisitions um, by Uruguayan artist Joaquin Torres Garcia. Um, so even though he is considered the father of Latin American constructivism, he spent over 40 years of his life in both the United States and Europe. Um, and both the palette and the imagery of this work reflects Torres Garcia's study of pre-Columbian art and culture and American Indian, um, Amer Indian, sorry, referring to the indigenous people of South America, um, as well as his dedication to modern abstraction. So I know this can um, tie in with some of the works that Nadia had shown before from the CMA collection. Um, and Torres Garcia was, he was really interested in studying the ancient arts, uh, ancient art of South America and in creating a South American visual language. Um, but while he was in New York, he exhibited with Stuart Davis and he became friends with Joseph Stella, um, Marcel Duchamp and John Graham. And Torres Garcia had a direct influence on Adolf Gottlieb and um, the previously mentioned Louise Nevelson. So like Mendieta and Negret, Torres Garcia was another kind of Pan-American figure who participated in this exchange of ideas and um, really influenced kind of the visual language of some US-based artists. Absolutely. I love this work in the Newark's collection. And we have to give um, a shout out to my former colleague and your colleague, the curator of American art, uh, Trisha Bloom at the yeah. Newark Museum. Uh, this acquisition was really smart in that it 
it bridged a lot of those gaps between it has, as you say, like a Pan American consideration um, because Torres Garcia was just such an influential theorist and artist um, based in Uruguay, but who, you know, went back and forth between the countries and um, yeah, and again, and ties in really nicely with um, Newark's really great historical and contemporary Native American collection. Yeah. So it, yeah. it's like a point at, at all of these, you know, Native American, Latin American and American and goes towards really like pulling them all together. Right. Um, and the Newark Museum also has a, a really rich um, art of the Americas um, collection as well. So a lot of, um, I guess we would consider them decorative art in but pottery um, and jewelry from Mexico, Central America. So this also ties in well with that as well. So, um, but that is the final slide that I have. And um, Nadia, if you have anything else or I can open it up to questions if. Yeah, let's do it. Um, oh, okay. So the first question, which I probably should have anticipated, is do you think Mendieta really committed suicide? So for any viewers um, that may be watching and might not be familiar with Mendieta's uh, history and death, um, she died under mysterious circumstances in 1985, I believe. Um, she was married to the artist Carl Andre. Um, there has been some debate on whether she committed suicide or whether Andre pushed her. Um, that the doorman of their building, she was on the 34th floor, um, heard a commotion, heard some fighting, heard screaming, and then she they they found her body. So there's, I don't know. There's actually a really great book for anyone interested called Naked by the Window, which like lays out really well the case and like the art world in the 1980s and um, kind of like the context of all of it. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, what I do know is that she, it's unfortunate that she was taken so quickly because her oeuvre as a result you know, ends in 1984-85 when she um, might have had just a very full and transformative career otherwise. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's unfortunate that we only had a small, a, a, you know, a couple decades of Mendieta's work. Right, yeah. Um, we have another question from Anne um, who asks, when do you think your museum will be open to the public? So I know for the Newark Museum of Art, I, I know we're looking at the fall. Um, and Nadia, I, I think you said that your museum is currently open, but some galleries are, are closed to the public. Exactly. So the CMA opened June 30th to the public. Um, and there are still some galleries where they're too tight to do proper social distancing. So they're waiting to open those galleries just kind of based on, you know, the climate and safety things going forward. But technically the museum is currently open. Okay. And, and free to the public. You just have to, um, you have to like get a ticket, even though they're free, you have to get a ticket and you do it online or by phone even better. <laughs> um, and now we have a question from Catherine. The connection between Latin American and North American art is having a moment this summer, like the CMA's exhibition and the Whitney's Vida Americana, Mexican muralists remake American art 1925 to 1945. How much do you feel that contemporary American politics Trumpism, um, has influenced the need to emphasize the connection of these artistic traditions? I think it, it I, I feel as if it has created the urgency around it because there is, um, there's such a rhetoric of fear of, you know, of denigrating migrants, of there being a mainstream conversation that doesn't quite give migrant stories the spotlight and humanity that it de deserves. Uh, 
And so integrating those stories and those narratives into a conception of American art as much as possible is um, work that I personally find valuable. And I am very, you know, glad when I see colleagues in the field doing it as well. Awesome. Excellent answer. <laughs> um, and we have another question from, I think, a different Catherine. Um, thank you both for the spirited and informative session. At CMA, Nadia, have you been including bi or multilingual labels? If so, do you have an opinion on whether such labels should be universal throughout museums? Or I guess, should they be limited to specific exhibitions or, or museums across the board? Yeah, that's a really great question. And Elena, I'd also like to hear of your opinion at Newark um, and what it is, because I know that they have um, recently integrated them. The CMA currently does not have bilingual labels, at least in the contemporary galleries, which I know for sure, and I don't think in other galleries um, currently. There are bilingual labels in the Graphic Revolution exhibition, um, Spanish and English. Uh, I think that you can't lose by doing it. I think it's always a good idea. The the result is just a more inclusive experience. That's it. And so that I, I feel like that's never a bad thing. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think um, museums can be intimidating for some people anyway. And I think if you are not a native English speaker or like that just adds another layer and another level of, um, I don't want to say intimidation because I don't think it's intentional, but um, maybe uh, distance, another level of distance that maybe makes it a little bit harder for them to be, as you said, inclusive or accessible or. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, especially when it comes to contemporary art, which is like even hard to understand <laughs> English speakers. Right. You know, like if we, there are some, you know, contemporary works that we feel very strongly about putting some sort of didactic label so that people have a framework for understanding, you know, like a minimalist canvas. Mm -hmm. um, so why wouldn't we offer that same access and context to someone who's, who doesn't speak English? I mean, Spanish is like a, a good start, but you know, the more labels, the better. Yeah, agreed. Um, I have a question from Facebook. Um, so does the CMA have a separate Latin American collection or is the show drawn from a works on paper collection? Arts of the Americas, is, are, are you, is the CMA kind of parallel to Newark in that it also incorporates Latin American as part of its American collection? So currently, the way that the curatorial division works is that some designations are geographical and some are medium based. So for the Graphic Revolution show, which um, was organized by the prints and drawings department, that department collects a glo globally. So this is from their holdings of um, Latin American works and there has been more of more acquisitions of uh, Latin American works in recent years. And so this um, exhibition is really showcasing uh, that their holdings have grown and that they are quite substantial. Um, the American department does not, its purview as far as I know does not include I'd have to double check, but I don't, Latin American is certainly not a focus of the American division, um, but there is a, a contemporary department, which I'm part of, and that purview is global. And we have some works in the collection by um, Latin American works. So um, some artists from Mexico, actually we just acquired a work by the Mexican artist Teresa Margoyes, which joins some works in the collection um, by Mexican artist Gabriel Orozco, Damien Ortega. Um, there's, uh, you know, Argentine um, artists, um, Guillermo Cuitca is in the collection. So 
it, it kind of works through, you know, it's, it depends on the department. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on the department, but there's, there are, but there are some Latin American works, you know, woven into, we used to have a textile department and they, and so there's several Latin American textiles in the collection, um, which are now under the purview of contemporary. So it's kind of cross departmental. Yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. Exactly. Very cool. Um, we have a question from Elsa who asks, Cleveland has a large Puerto Rican community. Does your museum have famous Puerto Rican artists on display? And does local or do local Puerto Rican artists submit works to your museum? We do not unfortunately have Puerto, a Puerto Rican artists on display, um, but that is something that I hope to change. <laughs> And it's a great question because Cleveland does have a large Puerto Rican population. And I think that that should be reflected in our galleries and in our collection. Um, the, the Cleveland Museum of Art also has a contemporary art space that they program in for part of the year on, in, on the other side of Cleveland called the Transformer Station. And so there are, um, there have been shows, you know, I started at the CMA in November, so I don't have a huge depth of knowledge as to like all of the shows that have been there, but certainly that space is a little more engaged with the local artists community and there's more opportunities for local artists to show there. So yeah, that's an excellent question. And um, absolutely, I hope that, that will be something that I get the opportunity to do in Cleveland. Um, and this question is, I guess more of a general question, but how old is the CMA? I should know that. <laughs> I think that it opened, well, I think that it opened in 1917. Okay. Okay. Because shortly after it opened, uh, and I discovered this recently, uh, there was, the last the the last pandemic that happened in like 1918 and they had to close for a few weeks because of that and I know that that was shortly after the opening so wow. I think 1916 17 around around there okay. but it has been hugely expanded since then in terms of its building so there's still kind of like an old building and then there's an expansion around it like a larger campus and no, no, like just an enclosed building. It's oh, like, okay. it was like literally extended as, as a single building. Um, so the spaces, the interior spaces of it are much larger than they were for that 1916 original building. Um, we have a question from Judy who asks, how many objects are displayed in the Graphic Revolution exhibition? Oh, that's a great question. Um, having, it's, it's about two small galleries. I don't have the exact number. I would guess um, maybe 30, about 30 works. And you can double check on the website because all of the works, if you go to exhibitions and you go to the checklist, all of the works are on the website. good to know. Um, and so this next question is from Francis. And um, what do you both think of the New York Museum of Art's recent name change? So Nadia, I'm going to defer to you on this question because I just started in November. So um, I, I feel like I'm too new to have an opinion and the name changed before I started. So <laughs> yeah, I was there for uh, on and off for about four or five years, and I still feel like I'm too new, too new to really have an opinion <laughs> on it. I, I'm biased because I only, you know, worked on the arts and end of it, so I felt like it was an appropriate push towards what an experience that you would expect to get if you go into an art museum mm -hmm. um, with its galleries. So, so I like it. I, I think it was a good move. I think it's, you know, it's more it's certainly more of an art focused institution right now. And I think that um, that is well reflected. Um, 
We have a question. Is, uh, has the CMA advertised the Graphic Revolution exhibit to the Hispanic community in Cleveland? I don't know. I hope so. <laughs> I do. I, I would imagine that they, that that would have been, uh, actually, yes, they have, uh, because there were, so what happened is that the show opened in March and there was, uh, anticipated to be, you know, an entire calendar of programming events. And one, I believe involved, um, a program with a local artist and it unfortunately didn't take place because of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that there was some outreach there and some hope and, and maybe still plans to do something. So yes, to some extent. And I guess kind of jumping off that question, um, I know you are a fairly recent transplant to Cleveland, um, but do you know, um, I guess, what the CMA's outreach is, is like with the Hispanic community in Cleveland or the Latinx community? I think it, it often is driven by programming. So okay. when there are exhibitions that feature Latin American artists, I know that the push to connect with those communities is stronger, like on a global level across departments in, in the CMA. Mm -hmm. um, so, to what extent they do it consistently, I don't know. But um, yeah, hopefully more, hopefully more and more with the way that things are going now and just a, a need to be more diverse and inclusive in everything that a museum does and the public it serves, you know, I hope more and more. And that it's not just driven by Latin American programming. Right, right. Okay. Thank you. That was just a question I had. Um, <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, so this question, I guess, is for, for me. Um, is the New York Museum of Art looking to expand its collection of contemporary Latinx artists, including those in the New York area? Um, and Nadia, I guess, feel free to jump in on this as well, since you, again, worked closely with, with Trisha with the Latin American Abstraction Gallery. Um, I do know that the museum recently acquired um, in the last couple years, two works by Joel Lopez, who is a Puerto Rican artist based in um, Patterson, and he has a studio in Newark. So I know that there, there is interest in that, um, but I'm just a curatorial assistant. I don't, I don't make those decisions, so. <laughs> but Nadia, I don't know if you want to speak to that based on your experience at the, at the Newark Museum of Art. Those, yeah, that's also, um... Joelle Lopez, I, I, those works were acquired around the time that I was there. So those are the works that I know of. Mm -hmm. um, but never say you're just a curatorial assistant. <laughs> Having been a curatorial assistant, you know the collection so well and have your hands on everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, oh, we have a comment from Elsa, who I believe she is referring to the opening date of the museum, which is, she's saying 1916. Oh, oh, great. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Elsa. Thanks. Nice to have uh, a fact checker. <laughs> and um, Nadia, I didn't know if you wanted to talk. We don't have any other questions at the moment, but I didn't know if you wanted to talk a little bit more about, um, I guess, the work that you're currently doing at CMA or um, your, your time kind of at the New York Museum of Art talking about um, Latin, Amer Latin American art as American art or both. <laughs> yeah, well, so the big project that I'm working on now and that I feel, you know, working um, with Trisha Bloom, the American curator at the Newark Museum of Art is really shaped is just reinstalling the contemporary galleries. And so the CMA is hoping to do the get a contemporary gallery overhaul in 2021, so next year. Um, and absolutely just wanting to make it as inclusive as possible um, and making sure that we get a diversity of stories out that speak to, um, to speak to a broad audience. So, so, you know, and taking into account just 
the audiences in in, um, in Cleveland, so Latin American audiences, uh, Latinx, African American, just indigenous, you know, whatever, however we can to get people in. Um, and if there's a way to integrate their voices, that's something that um, that the American galleries do in Newark really well. Uh, and so I would definitely like so that is a part of our goal is to make sure that you know that we do that we do the community justice mm -hmm. um especially now when you know like i said museums are under scrutiny for stuff like that yeah um oh we have two more questions and then i think we will probably be at time but um this first question is from Rebecca. Does the CMA and or the New York Museum of Art have partnerships with local schools? If so, have these collections and works served a role in integrating inclusive understanding of American art into the learning curriculum? Mm. So I, I can speak for the New York Museum of Art. Um, I can't speak for the education department, but I know we do have partnerships with the local schools. Um, and I know our learning and engagement um, department is incredibly robust and really just works incredibly hard with the local schools. So I, I know that that is a big part of what the New York Museum of Art does. And I don't know um, if you want to talk about Cleveland. Yeah, the Cleveland Museum of Art has a few programs that interact with local schools. Um, and I know just from my experience there, there's like, um, like a curatorial program called Currently Under Curation, where high school students are brought in and do and you know help to curate a show uh, and learn what curators do and um, are paid uh, for their work. Um, whether or not the collections are integrated into local curriculums, I don't know, mm -hmm. um, but I think that it's something that the curators of the different geographic collections would probably interested be interested in doing more. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't have a, a clear answer. Um, and I think this will be our last question. Um, oh, oh, um, okay. So, Catherine says, I have been attending lots of these kind of events and I am so thankful for them. They are such strong evidence of why art matters and why museum matters, why museums matter, sorry, in times of crisis. Thank you so much. I'm sort of afraid that as the crisis ends, these events will be less available. Do you all intend to continue after reopening? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't speak for Newark, but definitely in Cleveland, there's even if even though our museum is open, uh, gatherings of a certain programs can't really host gatherings of people over a certain number. So while our uh, programming output on a digital platform will not be at the same level that it was when the museum was totally shut, it will, it will continue to be produced. Mm -hmm. And I know, um, for the Newark Museum of Art, there is the intention to continue these types of virtual programming um, or these types of events through the end of the year, at least. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that people are enjoying it. I'm glad to hear Ooh, positive their comment. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and this last comment is, I guess, a follow up to Rebecca's earlier question um, that the Newark Museum of Art has a marvelous summer camp program. Um, yes, it's mm -hmm. happening virtually. Um, so thank you for that reminder. Um, and yeah, that's, I believe that is all the questions we have. Um, so Perfect. thank you so much, Nadia. Thank uh, you for having me. It was so fun to, to talk about some Latin American works and to you know see some old favorites from Newark and to talk with you, Elena. And thank yeah. you for all the really great questions. Thank so, you. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us today and thank you all for your wonderful and insightful questions. Please join us for our upcoming programs on Saturday, July 11th. Um, the latest installment of Norman Bloom Bit by Bit will be available on our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube pages. On Sunday, July 12th, we will be having our community day titled Say It Loud from noon to 5 p.m. commemorating the 1967 Newark Uprising. And 
thank you again, Nadia. So <laughs> thank you. Bye.